Awesome. Thanks, Doris. Um, you okay if I jump in for a minute? Yeah, that sounds great. Thanks, Steve. Awesome. Um, hi, everyone. Um, for those of you that, that saw me last week, um, nice to see you again. For those of you that might not have joined uh, right at the front uh, end, my name is Stephen Roach. Um, I'm an agricultural research consultant, an epidemiologist by, by training, um, based in Guelph, Ontario. And we work with industry, government, and academia quite a, a bit in the context of livestock health and welfare. Um, and about a year ago now, OMAFRA approached the Ontario Veterinary Medical Association and my firm about supporting them them in um, developing some African swine fever resources specifically targeting smallholders. So pet pig owners, um, backyard, um, uh, anyone ra raising backyard or owning backyard pigs. Um, and so they asked if we could support them in, in really building out any educational resources we thought there might be value in. And so here I am just um, sharing some of those resources. We had planned on, on providing some directly to pig owners and some uh, indirectly to pig owners through veterinarians, which is why we're, we're sharing here today. Um, what I'll just sort of orient you to in the chat, I've just put in a link um, that would take you to this page here, which is the OVMA website. And they've got a standalone page. We were asked to support OMAFRA in developing resources specific to African swine fever, which I'm sure as you've learned or are learning, um, if you don't have much of a background in, in before as a foreign animal disease, there is a risk of it coming to Canada and in the entire commercial sector has been spending the last uh, better part of the last two years working on preparedness efforts, uh, response planning and, and many other details. And they view um, pet pig owners, smallholders as one of those risks for, for a spread or transmission of the disease. And so again, this is sort of education and awareness. As you start to do research on folks that own pigs, uh, just a couple of pigs or uh, maybe uh, foster pigs, those kinds of things, or even raise them for meat on their own, is you know they're not generally viewing themselves through the commercial lens. They're not going to respond to the same type of messaging, the same type of concerns and risks that that commercial pig producers may have, or the concerns over exports, for example, all of which are major concerns when it comes to African swine fever. So while this is an African swine fever focused project, we tended to to take a bit of a broader perspective and say, how do you promote health and welfare? How do you make maintain health of your pigs? And so we do have some labeling and some messaging around African swine fever. But what I wanted to share with you is if you as a veterinarian are looking for resources to support yourself in, in communicating around ASF specifically, or you have clients or other folks that are interested in accessing resources, there are a number that are available on the OVMA website. More specifically, we've got some fact sheets here. I've already kind of clicked on these here. Whoops. Um, here it is. Um, we've got some fact sheets that just broadly and very plainly talk about what some of the risks are, why we should care about it, what we're looking at in terms of signs and symptoms, and then where they can go for more information. We also heard when talking with veterinarians that they'd like a little bit more guidance on what are some of the wants, needs, motivators, barriers for some of these folks. And so we came up with um, some personas, so, so sort of profiles about who these uh, individuals or the common characteristics of these individuals tend to be. So here we're talking about a pet pig owner and we're talking about some of their specific goals, their interests, their dislikes, and some of their trusted sources of information. We're finding a lot of these folks are getting their information from popular social media websites sites, community forums, those kinds of things, and sharing information, as well as their veterinarian if and when they engage them. So looking to share some information that way for veterinarians to understand some of the motivators and drivers for these individuals. So we have them broken down by a pet pig owner. We have them by someone who's really much more um, of, a, of a homesteader looking more for that sustainable living. Um, and then someone that's uh, more a small, very small scale commercial operation. One of the things we also did in my last kind of comment here is we produced a number of uh, videos. So we've got sort of more of a humorous video, uh, animated video that talks about why we should care about African swine fever and frankly, biosecurity and, and more broad based health and welfare um, measures from the pig's perspective. We also have a number of uh, live action videos which tell the story of from real veterinarians, registered veterinary technicians, and, um, and pig owners themselves. So those are all available through these links here. If you click them, 
It will take you to the YouTube channel where you've got um, where most of these videos are available. And so you'll see where we've uh, I'll just forward. We're showcasing interviews with pet pig owners. You know, what's it look like at their place? What do they do to keep their uh, pigs healthy? What do they do to respond or even identify um, sickness in their pigs? Those kinds of things. And again, we're showcasing those on the basis of um, our homesteader here. So she's raising food just for her own family for a variety of reasons. And we talk about those in, as well as some of the management practices practices she's put in place to try and curate a, a healthy and safe environment for them. So I'll stop there. I uh, just wanted to showcase some of those things and make sure you were aware of them. I'd encourage if you if you have an interest uh, to check the website out. If you have any questions or follow up, we'd be keen to hear um, uh, about any feedback you might have. Otherwise, that's it for me. Doris, Sue, thanks very much for taking the, the or giving me a bit of time here uh, and to showcase some of those things. And I hope they're helpful for veterinarians. That's the goal here. So thanks very much. That's great. Thanks, Steve. Um, so if anyone has any questions about um, what just Steve mentioned, feel free to uh, put it in the chat. I see Judy's already made a comment saying the videos are really interesting. Well done. So that's great. Um, and Sue, feel free to take it away with your last uh, webinar and we could uh, have 15 to 20 minutes for a Q&A after Sue's talk. Perfect. Okay. All right. Is this up there? Okay, Doris? Um, we nope, don't see your yet. screen yet. Nope. Okay. I didn't share a screen. No. This would be the final day and not doing it right. There we go, share screen. Here we are, this is more like it. There we are. Okay, so this is um, always, I think, the most fun um, session of the, um, of the four part series. It's a bit more relaxed uh, because it, it deals with strictly with pet pigs. And um, I, so I inject a little more humor into this session um, because I've given uh, versions of this talk to any number of conferences and um, it's it's just, I, I think it's a good learning moment, but I, I just can't help with the humor and I have a, a huge accumulation of memes and so I've stuck some on there. At any rate, so we're going to be dealing with pet pigs today. Um, lifespan of yes, 12 to 18 to 20 years, which Right in, in and of itself right there is um, a bit of a problem with many people because they're assuming they're going to acquire a pig and it's going to live, you know, 10 or 12 years and then expire. And then many people, um, you know, tire of these pigs, maybe their lifestyle change. And, and um, this is where we start getting into some trouble with pigs that are at middle and lower age um, or middle and, and advanced ages because uh, where are you going to put them? Um, also note that um, even if they want to travel and, and board the pig, um, there's not a lot of places that are happy to take them in, maybe more now than there used to be, but there are some, some certainly some issues with pigs as pets. So 40 to 65 kilos, but that's a wide ranging weight range, depending on which breed we're talking about and even um, the um, physical makeup of that particular pig. I have seen popularly pigs up to you know, 150 kilos plus. Um, rectal temperature, about the same as a regular pig's heart rate and respiratory rate as per normal. So on the top left, you see we have um, our dear friend, the Vietnamese pot belly pig, a mature pig, a um, healthy fat mature pig. On the bottom, we have a Juliana, which they tend to be smaller. They're sort of a spotted type of pig and um, uh, you know, a little livelier sort of pig, and then a kuni kuni on the top right. And you'll get mixtures of these and crossbreds and whatnot. So when we talk about pet pigs, I'm, I tend to refer to the pot belly, but um, sort of inclusive of these other breeds as well. Feeding the pet pig is always um, a large uh, issue with a lot of pigs, uh, people and pigs. Um, you find that they they may want to feed, you know, grower diets to pigs or sow diets. And, and I always recommend feeding a diet that's been designed for uh, mini pigs or pet pigs. Uh, certainly, um, there's mini pigs, uh, large colonies, mini pigs used in research. So there are commercial diets that are out there designed for them. You can feed commercial grower diet to young pigs. Um, but really, I think just the pet pig diet is the safest place to be. 
And again, much as we talked about in the first lecture with the heritage breeds, they're on a, they actually maintain on a much lower protein diet than our commercial pigs. So 12 to 14%. And of course, supplementing with fresh vegetables and fruits because pigs just like to eat. Feeding is, yeah, it's, it's, you know, as a rule, about a half cup per 10 kilos, you can divide it into a couple of meals. And pigs aren't always happy with that because they tend to sort of be grazers all day long, which is why, you know, you provide some kind of forage for them, whether it's uh, lettuce or, you know, sort of very low-cal vegetables, um, because they, they really get a little, um, very much like dogs, they, when it gets close to feeding time, they start to get a little owly and the, they'll let you know they're um, due to be fed. Baby pigs, free choice for up to six to eight weeks of age, because of course they're rapidly growing. They're gonna need that protein and, and energy to meet their requirements and then taper down gradually to adult maintenance about three months of age onwards. But again, um, depending on the kind of pig that you've got and um, uh, the breed. Housing, many of these pigs are gonna be living in the house, um, but you know, some of the, a lot of these pigs also are companions in barns. They'll have goats, they'll have pet pigs, or they'll have pet pigs with donkeys and horses. And so if they're going to be living in a, a barn that's obviously not heated, then you have to really remember to firstly increase their feed intake to provide for that extra metabolism these pigs are going to be performing to stay warm. And uh, secondly, um, you know, if they're able to provide a, a secondary source of heat, not just, you know, burrowing deep into the straw, but, you know, some kind of a doggy type, what I call a dog house with a heat lamp over top, high enough that the pig can't get at it and, and create some kind of a crisis in the barn. But, um, you know, a dog house with some bedding in it and a heat lamp, because these, you know, certainly Vietnamese potbelly pigs are tropical. They weren't really designed for Canadian winter, so they're going to need a little bit of extra warmth. And certainly in the summertime, um, and I referenced this earlier on with uh, some of our um, backyard pigs, you know, kids' pools are great. These uh, popular pigs love them and, and they'll easily go in and out of a kid's pool to keep warm in the summer because they don't have sweat glands. And so therefore it's difficult them, for them to um, radiate off uh, heat unless it's evaporative cooling, something like this, which is why they love mud wallows as well. We had some questions about vaccinations. Um, so I, I put this slide up there, uh, basically an aerosyphilis leptoparvovirus combination. There's commercial combinations available for domestic swine. It's certainly off label, but that's a big antigen dose. You know, if you're looking at two cc's for a 250 kilogram sow, you know, maybe we want to taper the dose down for these small pigs at two to three months of age. And certainly I recommend uh, two injections, certainly to get, um, adequate antibody production. So two injections uh, about a month apart, and then you can do them once yearly. Rabies, um, you know, about every three years is uh, what the literature is sort of recommending. And there was a really good question last week about tetanus. And I had said at that time, because I had it in one of my other slides from a source that I was reading that, oh yes, pigs can get tetanus. And then I thought, you know what, I need to review this. So thank you for the questions because um, they keep me sharp as well. So I went back and did some more digging around. And um, amazingly, diseases of swine didn't really comment as to they're susceptible or not, but they talked about tetanus. But in a um, pet pig manual, pot belly pig manual written by another veterinarian who's a pathologist, she, uh, she says, I suspect that pigs are relatively resistant to tetanus. And really um, just prevention of wound contamination is the um, best control. So not necessarily a recommended vaccine, but I think I leave it to um, everyone's own judicious uh, judgment. I always put in here bribing the pig afterwards, you know, if it's a negative event where you're vaccinating them, um, having, they, they love bananas, peanut butter, um, something that you can bribe the pig with afterwards if it does forgive you at all for vaccinating it because they have really long memories and they certainly have um, scent memories and you're going to be the bad person on the block unless you try to sort of wipe out the bad event with a good one. So again, uh, just a summary of, um, you know, leptospirosis. Um, if we have um, people who are breeding pet pigs, uh, whether it's kunikunis or other ones, uh, then you want to use your breeding shots, uh, aerosyphilis, lactoparvo. Um, you want to give them uh, semi-annually, so every six months. And um, 
depending on you know the size of the pet herd you know if they're again breeding then they may um, wish to include other vaccines such as an e coli rotavirus combination which we use in commercial swine um, just a, a same injection site as for the commercial swine um, behind on the neck behind the ear in front of the shoulder do not inject in the in the ham area these actually pot belly pigs will bleed rather profusely as i found early in my career um, where we were just sort of trying to vaccinate a pig in its general direction and i did manage to get the butt on this pig and yeah it um it bled so i was somewhat embarrassed afterwards i mean they're not going to be used for food production but saying that um it's quite vascularized back there and it's a big muscle so the neck is your best area to inject into and we saw this slide again last week about um, where to inject pigs Travel requirements. I didn't have this in last year, and I'm not sure where my mind was when I was putting it all together, but this reminds me of a great adventure. It was seriously an adventure about uh, a call I had this spring from a gentleman who wanted to bring six pot belly pigs over the border. They were moving over to Michigan. And um, at least he had the presence of mind to check with Canadian Food Inspection Agency. And yes, you know, pets, pigs are considered domestic animals and they have to have an export certificate. And, you know, and they have to also be tagged with a CFIA pig trace tag in order to go over the border. So the first call was basically to inspect the pigs, um, to try and corral them somewhere where we could get the tags into the ears. And it was truly a rodeo. And I was way back beyond um, down by, uh, oh gosh, down by uh, St. Catherine's area, Thorold. It was a gorgeous drive, but I was on a single lane road and I wasn't even sure I was going to wind up in a normal part of the world. So saying that, the next problem was um, getting them into a trailer, and, and that was another story. But suffice it to say that we you have two weeks, so you have to plan this out. You, when you inspect these swine for export, and of course you have to be accredited on top of that, um, you have two weeks for to get that uh, certificate uh, signed and to get those pigs over the border. Otherwise, it, all, the whole process has to be redone again. And coming back into Canada, um, they were being blood tested and quarantine for commercial swine you know you might want to check again with usda for pet pigs but i don't think that's changed a lot so they have people have to remind them to be reminded that you just can't you know sort of willy-nilly come back over the border again it's another export procedure um so that was export of swine just just because people like to take them in their uh, rvs etc and i actually have pe a couple people I did have a couple who were going down to Florida last winter and I, I did an export certificate for their pig that was traveling with them. So it's not uncommon to see people traveling with these. Um, this is uh, taken from an article in uh, PubMed. There's, um, it was a uh, drugs used for premedication and for induction of anesthesia in eight Vietnamese pot belly pigs that were castrated. So you see there's quite a, a lineup of um, combinations of, of uh, drugs that are used here to sedate them um, prior to um, uh, general anesthesia and the surgery. So we won't go over this too much. I mean, the, the first one there is basically um, similar to a premix um, phenomenon. And, and you know, we have uh, butorphanol is a very common um, uh, sedative or painkiller put in there along with the other drugs. So just take, you can take note of that. I think it's in your notes. This says, um, I carry this one with me all the time in my pet pig kit, um, ketamine, metotomanine and butorphanol because you get really deep sedation for short term. You have to remember also if you're out in these pigs, you know, whether they're in the house or they're outside, um, certainly can get quite excited if you're trying to get a pig board and squish them up against something so you can get this into their neck. Um, many of them are quite large, so it's not easy to pick them up and sedate them. And have patience. If you're going to do a pet pig call and you have some procedure you're going to perform, have lots of patience. Plan for the morning or the afternoon because you never quite know what you're going to get into. And sometimes what happens is um, because the pig is so excited that they're overriding 
these products and it does take sometimes up 45 minutes to an hour before they finally do lay down and drop so the, the trick is not to step in there with with a top up dose thinking you know i must have missed or some must have run out or whatever's happened um, to give them enough time to become sedated because if you over sedate you know they're going to sleep for about 20 hours and the owners aren't well, I mean, they're happy that you got the procedure done, but it is a bit concerning to them that the peg is taking forever. Nightmare for me, I, I tend to be, um, because I'm on the road all the time, I don't have a, a clinic per se. I have board clinics in the past. My connection is unstable. Somebody let me know by text or something if I fall off the face of the earth here. Um, I am on a hot spot. At any rate, uh, venipuncture is um, is tricky uh, in these pigs. I mean, the ear is good. Uh, ear veins, you can find them in uh, dark pigs and light pigs. And then there's also a radial vein that you can access on the leg. Um, I'm sure it takes practice. I've never been able to find that one. I've been able to find the saphenous in the back leg. Um, but basically, depending on what you're trying to do or to access blood, just be knowledgeable about the different sites. And in um, this is taken from uh, Christine Mozacchio's um, book. She's also on this Lefebvre site online. I'll talk about the book at the very end, but she does a nice demonstration there of showing you how to access the radio vein. Now, this is an, a white potbelly pig. And so, of course, you can see what you're after, but it's the black ones that, of course, give us all nightmares. So um, you can you know, explore this uh, on your own time afterwards. So I summarize this auricular vein, cephalic vein, uh, or radial vein, femoral artery and vein, um, saphenous veins. And if you're fortunate, there's a subcutaneous abdominal vein you might be able to access as well. So there are some different sites that you can get into. And so why am I talking about sedation first? Because you'll frequently be called to trim feet for pigs. Um, years ago, when I first started potbelly pigs and really there wasn't a lot of knowledge out there, um, I thought I was being extremely clever. And uh, I used to throw a blanket over the pig and make it into a pig burrito. And uh, much as we can do cat burritos and, and it, it was okay for some pigs. There's, it's, it's a high volume noise event because the pig's screaming inside the blanket. You're trying to get a leg out while the owners are sort of trying to keep the pig stable. And then you're trying to trim the hoof as somebody hangs on to a leg that tends to wave around. So it, it, um, it's pretty spectacular. I took my daughter with me a couple of times and I, I think um, I just had to stop because she was laughing so hard. I, I really couldn't concentrate on, on the job at hand. So, you know, as these concoctions came up for sedating these pigs, um, it made hoof trimming a whole lot easier. So certainly make sure you have the appropriate tools for hoof trimming. Um, you know, or, or goat nippers, uh, they usually work pretty well, horse hoof nippers, a Dremel, uh, metal filer rasp are really, really useful to have. And fortunately, there are now people um, that actually do professional hoof trimming for pet pigs. And uh, there's a couple in my area that have been going around and, and doing the pigs. And I, I have to say, I've been very happy to pass their names on to people. And uh, they've been, they have an excellent reputation because I'm really not an expert pot belly pig hoof trimmer. So we talked last week about, you know, certainly keeping an eye on those dew claws at the back. Um, don't cut them too short, but, you know, trimming the feet. And I have a short little video here too, but you, you know, you often run into feet that look like this and, you know, A, it's because, you know, these would be house pigs. And so they're not wearing down these hooves properly. And then B, um, with various, you know, um, structural deformities, whether they're valgus avaris, um, they're not certainly walking on the feet properly as well. And so we get this curling of toes and then, you know, people, often wait till they, they get to be quite um, almost non-functional and then you're called to come out and help trim these feet. So, and whoops, let me go back here. And I see that, ah, there we are. This is a cool little video, the one on the left. I'm gonna show you, I'm not gonna show you the whole thing. You can watch it, but it's, it's basically the same event. And this is preparing the pig for hoof trimming.
So um, I'm not going to go through this whole video. I think it's fascinating. And you'll notice um, when she's using the short fork on this pig, if you, because of the light behind her, you can see the pilo erections. It's a, it's a pleasure indicator on the pig when their hair stands up in the back of their neck, un, unlike other species. And so it's, it's really a cool thing to, um, you can relax a pig um, very nicely for feet work, but she's been doing this for a long time, but it's a great tip for people who are just, getting into a pet pig or, you know, have a young pig and they, they're wanting to work with it. So it's it's literally called a forking the pig. And um, it's it's a, just a neat little technique and I, I just love it to bits. On the right is a really nice little video on how to trim mini pig hooves. I'm just gonna play just a little bit of that as well. So this fellow's using a grinder on a sedated pig. Just stop there for a sec. I want you to notice, unlike cattle hooves, there's a huge um, uh, pad on the back of pig's feet. So he's clearly avoiding that. He's just leveling out the front hoof here and uh, grinding it back, but certainly avoiding this because it's it's really more of a thick keratin pad than it is uh, a true um, hoof structure. There. So you can you can watch that at your leisure. I just wanted you to see a little bit of it. But you know, two um, two different techniques. You know, one with a sedated pig, one with a pig that um, gets forked and can flip over. So um, both of these are are um, fun to uh, uh, to do uh, to watch. And then there's the technique called the pig flip. If the the pig is actually can be a variety of sizes, and it's getting in front of the pig, you know, having the pig in front of you, grabbing its front legs and just flipping it back and then holding on to it. So um, these hoof trimmers that uh, I work with that go and see different pigs to do their feet, um, they, one is very good at the pig flip, flips it back, holds those legs and the other one works away in their feet. On the right hand side, these folks have like a little piggy box. It's kind of hard to see. Um, and they sort of strap the pig in and, you know, he's sort of holding the pig, um, you know, and trying to keep it calm while she's working away in the feet. The more you work, it's like dog toenails, you know, I think the more you work away in them, the, the, some pigs are very good about adapting to it. Other pigs are screaming in the other direction, may require sedation. So it's all uh, dependent on the individual pig themselves. But there's, you'll see lots of different uh, methods here pig sling. This is a great pig sling. It's a commercial one. Um, that's Dr. Mazzacchio right there um, working on this pig. But these are, I think she told me these slings run about $4,000. So you'd, you'd really want to be a serious um, pet pig vet to invest in one of these, but I'm sure you could manufacture one. But there's a crank on it, so you can crank the pig in tighter. You know, she's got a blanket on it, you know, um, but once their feet are off the ground, the, the protests diminish um, rapidly and then you're able to work with their um, their feet. Okay. Um, as far as, um, just look here for a sec, make sure I'm, okay, still on board. Nobody's emailing me saying I fell off. Um, dental care is another one that will be, you'll be asked to do. So for tusk trimming, um, there are four permanent canine teeth and uh, they wrapped around five to seven months of age. Those are, those are their tusks, so to speak. And um, they, they certainly can cause difficulties with uh, malocclusion and discomfort. Um, and the other problem, of course, with the more aggressive pig is that they can use their tusks as weapons. Um, you know, they, can, they use them to, to fight with each other. They have a sideways movement of their heads and a slashing effect. And uh, certainly um, these tusks are, can be quite sharp and cause uh, wounds on other animals or people. 
So it, um, it just depends on the peg and how fast the tusks are growing. Most people start them around one and a half to three years of age. And um, most male pigs um, don't start to grow tusks you know, till really about 18 months. And they grow, I didn't realize this initially, and I had this question when pigs first hit North America, pet pigs, and they do grow both in intact and neutered males. So just because the pig is neutered doesn't mean he isn't gonna have tusks. Certainly you want to sedate them, um, or even with general anesthesia, depending on what the issue with the tooth is. And the pr problem with this, and I don't, this is not uncommon in my world, some tusks can grow at an angle and they can actually pierce the, the cheek of the pig or grow into the, the upper lip. And, you know, you have to maintain the tusk trimming for the health of the pig. Um, so the intact boars will have the fastest tusk growth. Uh, you know, a sow will be slower and spayed female. And really females, the, the, the tooth root closes about two years. So trimming really isn't necessary. It's, it's just those um, intact males or the neutered males. And so the upper canines are slower growing and they serve more as a sharpening function for the lower canines. And what we also run into, and this is not uncommon as well, is tusk root abscesses in older males. They're quite smelly. Um, you pretty much know what you're dealing with. He doesn't want to eat and he's got a really smelly mouth. So the other thing you need to know is that the tusks shouldn't be trimmed at the gum line because the pulp cavity may extend above the gum line. So it'd be, it's about an inch or two and a half centimeters above the gum line. Yeah, years ago, you know, when we weren't that well informed, we used to use nippers or bolt cutters, but that cracks and shatters the teeth. And so that can lead to certainly infection and pain. So using um, some kind of a, a rotary tool, the grinding attachment or a high-speed dental drill with a cutting bit if you're in clinic doing this is really useful. And I think I know, there's a photo of an amazing tusk that's just grown right backwards into the, the cheek of, of this poor pig, needs attention. And there's this high-speed dental drill with a cutting attachment on it. And uh, you see she's got a little piece of wood behind there. Um, just to, to steady everything and she's cutting across. So um, we've used a, a Dremel wheel at the clinic when I've had pigs in to have their tusks done. So um, there's a, a variety of ways to approach this. Um, surgical procedures. Uh, again, um, you know, there's the different uh, induction agents um, and you also had your sedatives earlier on. Note that the pig really should be fasted for 12 hours before surgery because pigs do vomit. They're prone to vomiting and we don't want them to throw up after they've had surgery. Water removed uh, about six hours beforehand. Um, so we don't want to have feed, you know, the moth feed any longer than that. Uh, also because just as an aside, they, they are prone to gastric ulceration and that can start within about 24 hours of not eating. So um, you know, while you're under general anesthetic, for whatever reason, do everything that you need to do because um, it's handier that way. So they can be intubated. Um, there's some suggestions for tube size and um, you need a stylet to get them uh, fitted to the back because of course it's a pig's mouth doesn't open very far. So it's, it's not quite the same as opening a dog's mouth where you can get you know, a pretty good view. You have to really use that stylet to help you out. Um, and so you, you really, um, you might want to um, you know, mask the pig down after sedation and get it you know, fairly deep, deeply anesthetized and then try the intubation. Um, you'll need, of course, two people. You have an assistant to open the, the pig's jaws and um, Note that the epiglottis is usually entrapped behind the soft palate, so you just use your stylet to flip that out and then get your tube in there. So yeah, uh, finding a vein is really difficult on pigs, and especially if they're in the clinic and they're pretty excited. Um, it's a strange situation; they're they're um, not very comfortable. So you know. Um, Please avoid um, multiple dosing of injectable anesthetic agents because with the pigs, this was an article in um, one of the journals I read, there's a possibility of permanent behavioral changes. So be mindful of that. I mean, just, just work with your sedative, have patience and time. Um, you can certainly uh, mask the pig down after the sedation. 
um, if that's what you need to do. But, you know, trying to, if it's going to be a bit fractious, I think the masking is a good idea. So, you know, intubating really where you're, you're in, in um, into surgeries that are more complicated, um, some of the cystic endometrial hyperplasias, pyometras, growths inside, older pigs. Um, if you have a, a really obese pig that you're really brave and you're gonna do some procedure on um, where there's a lot of jowls and pharyngeal fat, uh, that would probably be good reasons for intubation. Um, you can use a large cone face mask. You can, um, you know, pad the edges so there's no leakage, obviously, of, of um, anesthetic uh, material and or wrapping a towel around, uh, duct taping, um, certainly keeping an eye on um, the bag movement and, and not chest movements because pigs actually have a smaller lung volume than you would think um, looking at them. And the other I'm not sure if I put this in these slides, but the other thing to note is I don't ever tip these pigs because, because of their small lung volume, if you tip them on the surgery table, you know, tipping in their, their head down, you're going to have the abdominal contents push against the diaphragm and then compromise um, their ability to have the appropriate tidal volume. So um, that's sort of a general, like really quick run through. I'm not an anesthetist. So um, that's basically, uh, I prefer asking, just masking down myself for most of my procedures. That's, they've been pretty straightforward in the past. Um, please note that with pet pig castration, we don't do farm type castrations. We don't do them at three to five days. Some people that are breeding these pigs might do their own. Um, I think, you know, because they're considered a pet, Bring them into the clinic and have them done at four weeks, six weeks of age, um, whatever. The boar behaviors, if they're older pigs, will, as I said last week, will decrease slowly over two weeks. Um, also note that um, you know these these boars are um, pubescent around three months of age or so. The the Vietnamese potbelly pigs, so they can get really irritating really fast. So we want to make sure that they're um, taken care of before they get to that point. Pretty classic castration. Some people will use the, um, you know, the canine method. You know, where you just push them forward on the on the belly and and take them out that way. I actually just incise the medium raffing myself and take them both out. Um, leave a little drainage hole at the bottom, suture the the top, cut two or three stitches. And why? Because if these pigs are in a barn, especially and you do a ventral incision, you know, they're lying on straw or dirt or wherever they are. So I hedge my bets. Um, I, I decide, you know, how am I going to keep that incision the cleanest? And I, I work from that. So it's, it's optional as to which way you want to approach the castration, but they're straightforward. I do um, an open castration and uh, tie everything off and away they go. And, and, you know, there usually isn't too much swelling or drainage afterwards. They're, their testicles actually are, are held really tightly against the body. And I think that certainly allows for a reduction of um, fluid in, in the um, empty space afterwards. Again, we talked about this last week about um, pigs that have retained testicles. It's off on the left one. I told you also I had a whole litter, an entire litter of pup belly pigs. All the males had retained testicles. That was a real joy. So it's usually the left testicle always take that one out first and then don't forget to take out the one that's on the outside. Um, I, I like subcuticular sutures to close up. Um, if you wanted to recheck the pig afterwards, you certainly can you can put in a non-absorbable and then you know have them return to take them out and check the pig um, if the pig still likes you. So those two photos on the left, the top one is a retained testicle. The bottom one is just to show you what a squirtle hernia looks like in a um, potbelly pig. So you can definitely see that there is a lot of material there that don't appear to be testicular in nature. Um, you may elect to use antibiotics post-surgically. Um, you know, again, depending on the environment they're going into. So I leave it up to your discretion. Umbilical hernia repair. We talked about that last week as well. And, and you may find that you're going to do this in um, pet pigs, you know, small pet pig that has an umbilicus that became infected or there is a true hernia and certainly it's more successful in small pigs than if they wait till they're you know 50 or 60 kilos and then there's all this abdominal weight still pushing on so and just remember the hernias may be polycystic abscesses so you want to uh, try and manage that 
So pig spays, always the big question uh, for years. I think a lot more people are doing them now. I know a lot more people are doing now, so it's great. Um, it's about as, as easy as spaying a cat in a young, when you're doing a young pig. Um, you can do them like two months of age, three months of age. But they have a, certainly a very distinct vascular arc pattern. So it's not like a cat spay in that respect. You, you have to do all the lateral veins and arteries. So it's, you're kind of tying off a lot of stuff. Um, and certainly if there's tumors, which I'll address a little bit later uh, in the uterus, you may have an increased vascular supply. So there'll be a lot more tying off again. Um, and it just talks about uh, suture options, chromic, chromic gut, um, or you can use bicryl PDS. It's just kind of um, your choice and depending on sort of the difficulty and, and the object of the, of the spay or any complications of it. So here's what I was referring to. Um, female miniature pigs are uniquely prone to complications of the reproductive tract if it's left intact and the animals never bred. So they tend to develop cystic endometrial hyperplasia, leiomyomas or leiomyosochromas. Pyometria actually really is way down the list. And these abnormalities become really common in pigs greater than eight years of age. So in aging nulliparous animals. And um, it, it uh, took me a while to sort of recognize this. I worked with a, um, for a number of years with a popular pig sanctuary south of me here in Tilsonburg. And, um, you know, so we, they would be getting these pigs in and we didn't have a history of they were spayed or not. They were just you know, given up for um, fostering. And then we would have some pigs, you know, with the, the vaginal bleeding. And I think that's what I could just sort of never figure out until um, some really good research was done on these pigs. And actually, these pigs are used as a model for human um, uterine complications. Um, just because they uh, they develop them fairly regularly. So, you know, you can have abdominal distension, maybe some discomfort, um, like I said, vaginal bleeding, or it may or may not be anorexic. So they're um, a bit subtle. And then the uterine adenocarcinoma and the aged female will tend to see that. So I'm just going to show you, I took these photos a few years back um, when I was doing a lot more uh, spaying and neutering of pigs at that time. So it's it's really like a cat spay. It's just below, you know, it's below the umbilicus a fair bit, um, almost between the back legs, opening it up there. And in a young pig, it's it's seriously gratifying because it just sits right on top of the bladder and it just pops right out at you. Um, this big curly, almost, and the pigs will excuse me if I say sausage of a uterus, but it's like a big curly sausagey thing. Um, this pig actually was, I think it ovulated or was getting ready to ovulate on the right hand side. You can see the, um, the ovary there. And uh, just some more photos. There we are. Uh, you can appreciate the vasculature in this particular pig. So it's, it's cycled or is cycling and, and there's just, you have to work with all of this, but it's, it's all doable. It's, it's quite a, quite a bit of uterus, but it, I, I said it, it, if I had to put it in the difficulty scale, I'd park that right there with cats. It's really not that hard. Um, tying off stumps, my pedicles, and then clamping and doing my thing. And there we are. And I, um, with the females, I tended to go with, um, you know, my my typical, you know, your, your three layer closure, but I go with a subcuticular closure because um, a lot of these pigs, some of them were pets, some of them were from the sanctuary and they were from the sanctuary. I always wondered if I'd ever be able to trap the thing again to get the sutures out. So subcuticular worked quite well. So um, let's go into a few pet pig problems. Um, I'll go through just uh, some, it's a short list here. I think we already talked about the CEM and uterine cancers at the bottom. So we'll, we'll just go through a few of what I've seen in, in pet pigs. So, um, you know, erysipelas, uh, it's not as visible in black pigs. You'll often get a phone call that my, my pig is lying around. It's, it seems to have a fever, it feels really hot. Um, astute owners might actually recognize the raised lesions on the skin. So it's from the uh, erysipelas bacteria, it's a septicemia. And you certainly want to get on it ASAP because the chronic uh, sequelae of erysipelas infection are um, 
uh, valvular endocarditis and arthritis. So best to treat this. It's really satisfying to treat this. This bacteria is extremely responsive to penicillins, amoxicillin. I mean, you know, usually with with uh, a commercial swine, you know, you give it one treatment and the bacteria vanishes and the pigs immediately starts to feel better the next day. So interestingly enough, and this came to me from my sanctuary owner, um, the sequelae of erysipelas on black pigs are bleached areas of skin. So you get this sort of spotted appearance. And she'd had a couple of pigs with erysipelas and um, pointed this out to me. So it was very interesting, very astute of her. Uh, another really mysterious um, condition of potbelly pigs is uh, a condition called dipity and uh, also known as erythema multiforme. Usually it's associated with stress and usually it's in pigs that are less than uh, two years of age. And these pigs present suddenly um, really in a lot of pain. They're, they're hunching down on their back end. They've got their tail tucked tightly against their back legs. So you know they're really uncomfortable. They're, they're screaming, they're vocalizing. They may collapse, they may drag their back legs. They're restless, they're, they're distressed. Um, in a lot of pain and uh, it may be oozing. The skin actually is sort of cracking on top, splitting open and oozing. Um, it tends to resolve in two to three days, but it's really distressing for both the owner and the pig. So basically anti-inflammatories are recommended just to keep the pig comfortable. And this, this does tend to resolve itself. Um, the skin, you know, as I said, they're, they're really painful. The skin over the lumbar area is really painful. And apparently this also is seen, I don't know if I've recognized it in commercial swine. It may be just that I'm not paying attention. I think it's something else, but it has been reported in commercial swine also. So um, I also treat with um, like lanolin product, like Nivea cream, because um, it's an emollient and it, it, it you know, it seems, it seems to help, or I think it seems to help, but it also is give the owner something to do. And if they think they're helping out, um, that's a great thing. So anti-inflammatory, some kind of topical emollient, and uh, it should um, be behind you in 24 to 72 hours, but it's only in the young pigs. We don't see this in the older pigs. One of the most frequent ones that um, you're gonna run into with potbelly pigs uh, is mange, sarcoptic mange. And so we talked about sarcoptic mange way back in the beginning in the, in the first lecture. And so, yeah, it's still out there and frequently these pigs have it and frequently it's not recognized until the pigs look as horrible as these two poor things do. The one in the bottom is a young pig and, and it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's suffered hair loss from the intense scratching. These, these things are really cause amazing pruritus in pigs and they just scratch all the time. And so, you know, they'll wear the hair off and, and they certainly get uh, quite miserable um, when they have mange. The other thing with mange, which is interesting, every once in a while, um, I'll get a call from a physician or an owner and they'll get a, a young pig and of course they'll be carrying it like a baby, you know, against their belly. And of course the mange mites will um, try and invade the human. It's a dead end infection, but they'll burrow, you know, somewhat and they'll cause this really intense scratching. And then you go to the doctor and the physician and they're like, you know, trying to, they either figure it out or they're trying to figure it out. And sometimes I've had phone calls about this and I said, well, it's mange, you know, and then everybody has a fit because it's mange. And so it's, it's really useful to try and recognize it or find out if people have some kind of mange control program on the originating herd where these pigs are coming from. So to treat it, ivermectins are really satisfying. It's a two dose regimen, 19 to 21 days apart. Why are you going to inject the pig? It will never forgive you. Um, we can give this stuff orally, one cc for 75 pounds or one cc for what, 35, 37 kilos. Um, I like to put it on a small, you know, small, like a quarter slice of bread, squirt my ivermectin on there, spread it with lots of peanut butter and give it to the pig. Brilliant. And the pig doesn't mind at all. But I had a, a case, uh, and here's the pig in question. So it did not look like mange. The complaint was that the pig had experienced a severe change in attitude and was incredibly grumpy. Um, wasn't anywhere near the pig it used to be. And it had these sort of, um, you know, excoriated lesions along it. I 
my my go to to diagnose often is just scratch them and they're just they go crazy they just want you to scratch them forever so you you know they're they're quite pruritic and this pig wasn't quite like that but boy she was ugly and i did a pile of skin scrapings of course it's it's uh, can be futile sometimes to find sarcoptic guys because they're tunneling away in there so i guess as the scalpel blade comes at one end they're they're popping out the other end and maybe it's like whack-a-mole so I uh, could not find mange mites, but my presumptive diagnosis was mange. So I said, you know, we're just going to go with this. And so we went on the ivermectin, two doses, 21 days apart. And she called me and she said, you know, it's not working. And I said, well, let's go with the third dose. And it still wasn't really doing anything. And then I recall reading somewhere in, in my um, travels about uh, resistance developing to the ivermectins. And that's not a good thing in our world. So there's another product called Dectamax, and it's it's a slightly different chemical construction. And uh, so I put the pig on a double dose of Dectamax, and you see the pig down below. That was after two treatments. That was within you know a week or two after the second treatment. So note to self: be careful of um, resistance in the ivermectins. Like I said, it has been reported. And so another. Another similar skin condition, and you might see this in pot bellies, and especially if they're on an unbalanced diet or a diet that's really too heavy in calcium, which is a bivalent iron, iron, iron that will interfere with the uptake of zinc. And we'll have a condition called parakeratosis. And it's this really thickening of the skin on the legs, the belly, sort of the jowl area, the pig, but it's notable because it's not pruritic. So you'll still probably want to do your skin scrapings and whatnot, but you want, like I said, we're peeling the onion was the thing. So if you see a pig come in and, and it's, you know, you go to see pigs and they're not really scratchy, um, you know, you might want to ask about the diet and what they're being fed. Um, so back to the ivermectin, certainly deworming is um, useful for these pigs, especially if there's multiple pigs on a property. Um, Ascarasum is the pig roundworm. They're quite long. There's a pencil with an ascarid from the pig. They're pretty gross. People always flip if the pig passes an ascarid. Um, yeah, doing a fecal exam, just you know, see what the fecal count is. You can use ivermectins, um, parental pan pamoate, you know, it's tasty. You can use strongid tea on the pig. They'll thank you for that. Uh, or the peanut butter and bread trip. And, you know, keep an eye on that, especially if they're sort of backlot pigs. And I uh, remember ascarid eggs like to live forever. So you want to keep an eye on that. Um, bad joke on the right. That was, <laughs> it's a pig joke. I know it's a pig vet joke. Uh, just quickly, urinalysis. Pigs have remarkably dilute urine, um, but they can range, you know, they can range from 1010 to 1050. So just uh, don't get too excited if you have a really dilute pig urine because that's just the way it is. Of course, that leads to our own favorite um, discussion. Your general anatomy of the male pig, why? Because we're gonna talk about urolithiasis. And the one thing I want you to notice is that big blue arrow that's pointing down to the sigmoid flexure of the pig penis. And this is where you're gonna get into big problems with urolithiasis because you just can't pass something around there. So this is, this is a problem um, in the pot belly pig. Um, Obviously, it's much like cats or dogs, strangurea, dribbling urine, painful abdomen, teeth grinding, profound grinding of teeth. But, you know, they'll be dipping their backs, trying to expel some kind of urine out. Um, and, you know, like I said, the, the structure of the urethra and also they have a corkscrew penis on the end. So it's like really tricky to even get a catheter in, never mind trying to do some hydro retro propulsion. If you're fortunate with some sedatives and as antispasmodics, you might be able to ra relax that urethra and they might be able to pass the, um, the offending calculus. Um, beware, this was a note that came up in um, one of the, the uh, journal articles I was reading for something else, that bethanicol for bladder function um, in pigs may produce really bad side effects. Like, there's sort of teeth grinding and colic and flatulence and sort of not what you want to have. You really got to follow these up closely because um, they just, some of them are going to require surgical invention, end of story. And the other problem we run into here is um, uh, 
little diverticuli, this is close to the bulbal urethrogran further high up. So the pig just seems to design to thwart our efforts to get these calculi out. So there's a, a really good article in um, CBJ, and you can look up different ones on, this one was a percutaneous cystolithotomy procedure, which I thought was really cool. So I put the reference in there. Um, if they're on the commercial Missouri pig diet, it does contain ammonium chloride as an acidifying agent. So that should help um, try and, and preclude this. And um, don't use the feline diet, the dissolution diet. It's not balanced for swine. It's really high in protein. It's not a long-term option. That's just a photograph um, taken up from that uh, CBJ article on just, um, you know, getting in there and getting that calculus out is pretty cool. Um, yeah, another bad meme. Hopefully you're all laughing because uh, I know it's uh, getting long in the day. So arthritis is certainly, not only is it certainly an aging human phenomenon, it's an aging pig phenomenon. And um, an arthritic pig, they, they really are sad creatures and maybe bent over on their knees. You certainly want to rule out any younger pig, maybe osteochondrosis, um, which pigs are also prone to, but you know, that arched back on, you know, almost walking on its hind legs, trying to stand up and get the weight off those front legs. It's, um, it's pig, you can see that it's lost some weight. It's got some hanging folds of skin in the back and some wrinkles there. So this is definitely a pig that's uh, struggling. This was um, a pig that um, I saw this woman had uh, five or six of these pigs in her house. She was devoted to them and she lived in the country. She also had uh, radio frequency collars on them and uh, electric fencing, which I thought was really great. Um, but she was propelled to do that because they were going to the neighbor's garden eating the roses. And so that wasn't making for good neighbors. So anyway, um, this poor thing had developed uh, arthritis and was getting around on its knees and its, its left front leg, as you can see in the far right photo was pretty much frozen backwards. And it got around and it was eating. It wasn't in bad shape here. And, and um, she loved it dearly. So we decided to let it go for the summer. I mean, anti-inflammatories aren't going to help you with the frozen joint much, but we worked with it and gave it the summer to enjoy, and then we um, euthanized it prior to fall arriving. Um, it's, it's very common in older pigs. Um, like I said, osteochondrosis is not uncommon in swine. So diet, age, previous traumatic injury, and certainly, as I said, you know, in small pigs, if there's an infected umbilicus and there's seeding of the joints, there could be a septic arthritis that forms in the small pigs, and um, that could leave some lasting damage if they get through that. Um, glucosamine, congruent sulfate, the meloxicam works really well in swine. Aspirin works really well too. I actually use some um, aspirin in commercial swine herds if we have, for example, uh, an influenza break, which is going usually fall, winter, we'll see that. And you know they'll they'll run really high fever as much as people do, and of course you get a cytokine uh, explosion, and we'll put um, uh, powdered aspirin in the medicators and run them through, and it's an amazing product. Pigs pigs absorb it really well, and it works really well. So you can certainly use that as a go-to for swine. Um, you know any of the anti-inflammatories. Oh, my photo didn't come through here. Sorry. Um, this was uh, you look at the flooring. If you certainly have an arthritic pig. You know, are they in slippery tile or linoleum versus carpeted areas? So some people will carpet that photo that you're not seeing. So use your imagination and draw a square with a picture of a hallway and a carpet going down. And so you can have a carpet walkway for the pigs. And, you know, hopefully it's a reasonably good carpet, you know, have a rubber back on it so it doesn't slide all over the place. And pigs will certainly preferentially walk where they feed more stable, where they feel more stable. So you can you can work with these pigs. It's it's totally possible to do. Um, yes, when pigs fly, one of my favorite sayings. Quick talk about pneumonia. I really don't see a lot of it uh, in pigs, probably more so it would be in, in uh, grouped pigs, you know, if there's a population on a farm, may or may not be febrile, may or may not be anorexic, uh, increased respiratory rate. If you see an abdominal lift, they've got a decent uh, case of pneumonia and certainly coughing if they're roused. And, and um, I should insert here, you know, if, if they're relatively younger pigs, um, you know, they're coming into, a, or they're living in an area that they, they can't rotate through, you know, and it's not being cleaned frequently, 
you, you probably still want to take a fecal sample and look for roundworms because remember swine roundworms migrate through the liver, the L4 larvae, and uh, into the lung area and they're coughed up, swallowed, and they finish their development. So, you know, severe coughing, you want to rule out an ascarid issue. So you've got lots of treatment options. Um, you know, you know, pick and choose uh, whatever you think is appropriate. It's a little tough to diagnose. You can certainly rule out mycoplasma and influenza. They say at the beginning, you can just do um, nasal swab rope testing. Uh, if they'll chew on the rope, you can you can get some um, results that way. Uh, nasal swab, certainly if you've got a, a snotty nasal discharge in coughing pigs, the first thing in my radar is influenza. So you can just take a viral swab of that. Um, and if there are pet pigs, you know, and depending if you've got one or two or five or 10 in a barn, oral products are always preferred in non-critical pigs because um, injecting a pig, so you can use a product that may have, say, seven days, like a Draxin product, which is a seven-day product. But if you had to re-inject, um, you'll never be forgiven again, or the owner won't be forgiven. So again, pick and choose your battles. So again, as I said, you know, influenza, certainly look for any history of um, humans having influenza and being in contact with the pig, because influenza is zoonotic both ways. And our concerns certainly are viral reassortment. So we do, like I said earlier on beginning, try and keep chickens away from the pigs. The chickens are in their separate area of the barn, hopefully separate airspace. Um, but you can certainly, um, like I said, take nasal, nasal swabs. The lab does automatic typing of these and find out what we're dealing with. And, and sadly, one of the, um, one of the problems I have seen regularly over the years in pet pigs is water deprivation, and it's called you know, the old name for it is salt toxicity. Um, and so the owner is often aware of the pig's requirement for water. Remember that to really dilute urine? Yeah, they're not concentrating. So they pee, they drink, they pee, they drink. And so if they've been deprived of water, you know, um, four to five days or more, um, they'll develop, start to develop clinical signs, so obviously thirst, constipation, of course, because they don't have any water intake, and that evolves into central nervous involvement. Um, and so you'll just have intermittent convulsions starting after deprivation, and then people will often just feel terrible because they've forgotten to, to water the pig. I One of the worst cases I had was pig in garage, owners go on holiday, had the neighbors taking care of it, neighbors forgot. You know, a pig went a week without water, and um, it, it, you're not bringing them back. The, once you start rehydrating that really dehydrated brain, you know you've got an osmotic effect. You've you've got cells exploding. You know you've got really big neurologic damage, and so you get clonic and tonic convulsions, opisthotonus, and these just get worse with time. Animals, if they do happen to get through this, often become blind and deaf. Um, and most effective animals will die within a few days. So it's it's something to remind people uh, that you know pigs really have a requirement for water. They're not cats. Um, you can try and gradually rehydrate them, but the prognosis is uh, pretty darn poor. So um, we try and avoid that. And then one of the the most difficult areas, of course, and and whether you're with small pets or you're with horses or whatever it is, is the time for euthanizing that pig. And um, some of these pigs may be really, really fat. And then, you know, getting an ear vein can be really difficult. If you look at this pig, it looks like it may have had frostbite at one point in its ear because it's only got half an ear and good luck finding a vein there. You can, you know, bring it to the clinic, but usually these pigs are fairly compromised and they're at home. And so they're asking you to come out. And my advice is you make, you plan for the time. Um, I've done a number of pigs over the years, and especially at the um, sanctuary. And, you know, it's a process. So I, I, I really drop the pig hard with um, my um, favorite, you know, pre-med and I actually overdose it because I want it to go down. Um, if you're able to find a vein, that's great. Um, but remember the other problem is that barbiturates are fat soluble. So you better plan on using a lot more than you would in other species. Um, you can heavily sedate them and use T61. I haven't done that. I mean, I just, I actually would just go intraperitoneally. I'd sedate them, go IP with a barbiturate. We would sit and talk. It was a nice summer day, just visit while the pig was at our feet. 
and you know eventually it would fade out um if if the pig you know was a compromised pig then we knew it was heavily anesthetized after the ip um, the owner was always good with me going just with an intracardiac but that can be really disturbing for some folks so um, you want to make sure where the comfort level is uh, on that and finally i have to tell this story um I gave this lecture at the Western Vet Conference uh, a couple of years ago, and this is one of the best pig stories I ever had. So you need to hear about George. He was a rescued pot belly piglet, and he was about three months old when he entered the sanctuary. And I had a call from the sanctuary telling me that he had about two or three inches of his penis was protruding. And because George was just a small little guy, it was dragging on the ground. It was just this floppy little thing. And, and so the sanctuary owner was fabulous, but she just didn't want him outside lacerating this penis. And, and so he, he wound up living in the house, which was, you know, like going to heaven. And um, so he had to stay in the house to avoid lacerations and on um, the crusty grass and earth and things. But he definitely had no problems peeing because he peed all over the house. So. Uh, we talked about that blue arrow and, and the um, sigmoid flexor of the penis, but there's also these retractor penis muscles. And it appears, so this is not George, but I finally found a photo of a pig. This is uh, an intermittent issue you'll see in male pot belly pigs, and they have this sort of penile prolapse. And it has to do with probably underdevelopment of those retractor penis muscles. So what did we do? We brought George to the clinic and we anesthetized him. And of course, what are you gonna do? You're gonna do a purse string, try and keep the penis in there. And so now they're sleeping and everything's relaxed and you're like, well, how narrow do I make this prepucial opening? Well, I got it wrong the first time because the penis fell out again, but the owner was pretty game. So we did a second attempt and I failed magnificently on that. So we decided then we'll just keep George in the house and we're gonna give it tincture of time. And that's a wonderful tool in my veterinary box, tincture of time. And hopefully that penis muscle would start to do its job. But I have to say the sanctuary owner was far more intelligent than I'll ever be. So she brought in a secret weapon, a grandma who crocheted. And some of you may know where this is going. So grandma crocheted us a cod piece for George. And for any of you that are too young to know what a cod piece is, it's from Middle English and it's a covering flap or pouch that was in the front of the crotch of men's trousers enclosing the genital area. And so of course this was worn years ago in the medieval times. So we had this thing Velcroed onto George and it held his little penis and we had two or three of them. So I guess of course they got wet from urinating and you'll be happy to know that over time George made a full recovery. And finally, just for trivia, because we have a couple minutes for trivia, uh, we know pigs have an incredible ability of smell. Their olfactory bulb takes up 7% of their brain. The human olfactory bulb, and here I think I can smell wonderful cooking and I love good food, but it only takes up apparently 0.01% of my brain. Pigs have 1,113 olfactory receptor genes. And for the record, cows have 1,186. They have more than pigs. Humans have 350. But I think the fun would be at a truffle hunting if we use cows in France, as opposed to that wonderful spotted pig over on the left. And finally, finally, I promise I'm done now because I see we have a lot of questions or chats anyway. Um, this book, by Dr. Christy Mozacchio just came out, uh, I believe this spring. You can get it through Amazon and I think on Elsevier as well, Potbelly Pig Veterinary Medicine. She's a brilliant woman. I met her at the Western Vet Conference and um, she does a lot of potbelly pig work. She does, she's also a pathologist. She's uh, just a great resource. Um, I'm, I give talks, but I am not a great resource as this woman. I just think the world of her. So if you're looking for uh, an excellent uh, reference book for your library, I highly recommend that you invest in this one. And with that, we have come to the conclusion of our four part series. And I hope you've enjoyed Pet Pigs because I always love giving this talk. Sue, 
Thanks, Sue. I'm just laughing at the last comments. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Judy. Um, maybe I'll just scroll up a bit because I do. Uh, I do know we had a few questions here. So the first one is: um, Can water medications like antibiotics be given to pet pigs, or is it realistic only in commercial practices? So, water medications. You know, it depends how much the pig is drinking. We we can. You know, we know. I, I have a rule of thumb in commercial swine: hundred pound of pig drinks a gallon of water a day, and convert that to metric. I'm an old. I'm, I'm bilingual, but I can't go backwards in time right now. So, but with pot belly pigs, it's less certain. So, but you certainly can give. You know, the amoxicillins and things. You know, that the kids formulations that you just add water. There's piles of those things out there. And they're flavored, and so the pig thinks that's just grand. And I, I think you would probably want to go with more accurate dosing and going with that kind of uh, modality than um, trying to figure out how much to put into the cereal bowl. All right, that's great. Um, our next question is: Have you had any luck using the ultrasound to look for lung consolidation to diagnose pneumonia, or is there just too much fat in the pig? Probably gonna have a hard time getting through. Um, the fat, et cetera. You can do it in, in pigs that are, you know, not, not as heavy, um, you know, or even trying to do a regular radiograph on them um, might be useful. I'm not sure how far the ultrasound would get through that. We have a uh, question from the Congo. This is great. We have a guest from Congo. So I wanted to ask a question in relation to the previous session. What would be the clinical diagnosis to differentiate between foot and mouth disease and swine vesicular diseases? Um, because he might have missed it last week. Okay, so any, what I'll tell you with these pet pigs, if you see vesicles, blisters, lameness, um, anything that looks like a vesicular disease, you stop right there and you have to call the Canadian Food Inspection Agency in. We do have one virus here, which is Seneca Valley virus, which will cause vesicles to appear on the snout and nares and also on the coronary band of swine. Um, and pet pigs would be no less susceptible. Um, again, because you can't tell by looking at it what you're dealing with, and because it's a vesicular disease and a potential trade barrier, you need to call the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. They'll take the sampling and they'll define, you know, they'll, as in commercial swine, we've had a few cases of Seneca Valley here in Canada and they'll they'll tell you that's what you're dealing with, rule out foot and mouth. So it's, it's really out of your hands. It's just recognizing you've got something unusual and then making the phone call. Another question from um, the same participant. Is there any specific treatment for aggressive male pigs? other than uh, castration? Yeah, pig behavior is a whole um, another area. There are some pigs that are really aggressive and remain aggressive. Some pigs are very dominant in households. If they're living in the house with people, um, you know, you can't really bribe them with food. And, and in the past, I've actually told people you have to treat the pig like he's a pig in a pig group. And if they get to be too much, you roll up a newspaper and, you know, bonk them and make a big noise. So you're not hurting the pig, but you're making a large noise. And so these pigs will, you know, they'll, they'll grapple and, and they'll, they'll fight briefly. And then, you know, the, the bigger pig will win. And so you have to be the bigger pig, but aggression certainly. And, and there are some pigs that are at the sanctuary because they were um, just social failures. They were just super aggressive with people they, they weren't um, they weren't good pets, and then they just wound up living as pigs contentedly within their own little mini groups that they got along with. Thanks, Sue. Um, next question: Are there any particular house plants or human foods that are particularly toxic to pet pigs in the house? Um, so, thinking of cats and lilies and Tylenol. Yeah. Um, I don't know about Tylenol and pigs. That's a really good question. I just stick with aspirin because it works so well. So I, I would just assume a toxic plant is a toxic plant. Um, nothing is jumping out in my mind. Pigs really, I haven't really seen them going after um, house plants in my experience. They they seem to be ignoring those. They prefer to go out and you know snuffle in the grass and and uh, you know eat the neighbor's rose bushes, but. Not so much, you know, the the toxic house plants. 
but you know if you have one get rid of it <laughs> if you have a pig let's just pay the safe side um i have another question on any success on pre-meds in particular for spaying pigs uh so that um we would just we've used the premix at the clinic that i showed you in that um that first slide on on uh, sedatives for pigs combos i would just go through that i think all of them are fine they all seem to have mitazolam butorphanol and something or other um, and, and they're all pretty good just remember that have patience with the pig because they're going to take longer to, to sedate than um, because they're stressed and in the clinic than other pets tend to be um, actually going back to a question from judy any experience with pet pig owners giving them cbd oil It's ringing a vague bell, but um, mm, mm, mm. I think one person did for her really arthritic pig. Um, I personally don't have enough experience with it. So that would be certainly useful to um, maybe ask Dr. Mazzacchio. She might be uh, have more answers for that than I do because she's got a good part of her practices for pot belly pigs. All right, that's a good idea. Um, I, I, you might have mentioned this. Uh, well, anyway, the question is, can Medicam be used chronically for treatment for arthritis? Yes. Yes, I have a pig that's been on Medicam for years for arthritis and it tolerates it quite well. And what dose, Sue? I don't know if you could mention that or if that's... Uh, that was the oral dose, a 0.4 milligram per kilogram. Okay, that's great. Um, we had Wendy asking, do you intubate spays? I haven't when I was doing them. I'm, I'm sort of past that point now. I, I'm uh, my pot belly pig, you know, surgery practice is wound down because I always had to rent a clinic somewhere, borrow it. Um, but I didn't intubate my space, but many people do now. Um, so I, I think it's it depends on the pig and and um, your your comfort level. That's great. Um, I have a question from Fabrice. Apart from diseases, what would be the other constraints of considering pigs as pets? I take, for example, the deficiencies of meat in the regions of Africa. Wouldn't there be a level of meat production that could facilitate or justify this kind of practice um, in my region with many concerns related to meat deficiency? Sure. Certainly in, in um, you know, the Vietnamese potbelly pig, it's not designed as a pet pig. It was designed to be social around humans. It consumed the garden waste and whatnot, and then would eventually go into the pot at some point. So, you know, that's its its historic origins. Um, and certainly these, these pigs are more nimble, you know, in, in meat deficient areas, you know, it, it's, it's like, for example, goats for meat and milk production in areas that just can't sustain dairy. These pigs again would be appropriate for that. I mean, in North America, you know, we have a different take on it, but in other parts of the world, that these these animals were selected and designed for a practical purpose. All right, we have some time for two to three more questions, so feel free to um, unmute yourself here, or you could just chat it in the chat box. Great. Well, Sue, it's lovely to have you as our keynote again. I, I certainly learned a lot. Uh, I, I feel like I learn every year and this the last this, this course has been great. And I want to thank you again for being such a great instructor. We have one more question from Liz. Um, what are your thoughts on pulse, um, pulsing antibiotics in water for smallholder swine operations after weaning? Yeah, there was a, a really interesting article it's some years ago now in, in Journal of Swine Health and Production on pulsing antibiotics. It's from written by Jerome Del Castillo. He's from University of Montreal. I was very, I was very intrigued by that article. So depending what you're targeting, you don't need antibiotics after weaning necessarily, but if there's, uh, let's, let's say a respiratory issue that is a challenge for these pigs, it's a certain time of year, you can, you can certainly opt to use antibiotics, you know, three, four, five days post weaning or when the period of challenge starts. And then you can pulse dose, you know, one of my techniques is to run the five day program and then 
every week or two run just pulse in a couple of days. Depending on what I'm dealing with, that's a really general um, discussion or description, but you can pulse dose, but go to Journal of Swine Health and Production, and you're going to go back probably 20 years, but Del Castillo from uh, University of Montreal wrote on pulse dosing. Thanks, Sue. Um, uh, so I think that's any, any other questions we have room, we have time for one more question. Oops, sorry, Sue. I might have accidentally muted you. <laughs> so you go ahead. Sorry, I might have. Asked. There we go. There we go. Um, yeah, I, if you're looking for cod pieces, don't look at me. Um, I think the, the old lady retired. So, um, <laughs> but if you know a good crocheter um, and you get into the situation pot belly pigs, then you're you're golden. Thanks. That's great. And yeah, I just wanted to thank you again. This is great. And uh, I've been hearing lots of really good feedback offline as well. So really happy to, to be able to do this again. So we're going to be um, sending everyone the race certificate for each course that you've attended um, in real time. So uh, you'll, you'll be expecting, I guess we'll be sending these uh, certificates probably this week, otherwise likely um, late by like Wednesday, uh, next week, Wednesday latest. Um, yeah, th no problem, Dave. And if you do have any questions, feel free to email me. We'll be sharing our recordings from the four lectures online on our CAS website. I'll make sure to share those links with everyone as well, but feel free if you have any questions, um, feel free to reach out and I could uh, send them back to Sue. All right, thanks. Have a good night, everyone. Bye. Right, thank you.